make your uh, best love songs and hymns 166. We'll stand at 166. Jesus saves. That's right, 210, 210, near the cross. Amen. Amen.
young ladies have a special force. chapter number one and we are still dealing with the prayers of the Lord's prisoner the prayers of the Lord's prisoner now I had uh, okay let me open another text here then Colossians chapter number one, and uh, we're going to, we might even put a name on this and call it the full knowledge, or call it full knowledge and fruitfulness. We're dealing still with Paul's prayers, and we are particularly dealing with Colossians chapter number one, 
and verses 9 through 12. Verses 9 through 12. If you follow me there, for this cause, let me read it out of this one. For this cause, verse 9, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. So it's a prayer. And to declare that she might, this is what he prayed, declare that ye might, desire, excuse me, that she might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, Amen. that she might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. Let me go ahead and read down uh, through the, I'm going to go ahead and read down through the 14th verse. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet. That word meet there, M-E-E-T, means suitable or fitting. Made meet, made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us, delivered us and translated us, amen, into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, and there, there are too many, every, every little expression in there, I want to stop and say something, but I'd better stay on a course here. Otherwise we'll be here uh, all afternoon. There's just so much, there's so much packed into a small uh, space there in the scriptures. Heavenly father, help us in the next few minutes. <clears throat> Use this text, father, help us to uh, become greater prayer warriors, one for another. And go beyond, Father, the physical, go beyond the temporal, go beyond the medical. Uh, although all of those things, Lord, we accept as our duty to pray. Father, to go on to the things that matter to the new man and matter to the church, and matter to the glory of our Savior in the lives of each one of us. Lord, help us now in the next few minutes for Christ's sake, in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. So we'll call this full knowledge uh, and fruitfulness. This, this prayer here is similar in many respects to the prayers of Paul that we've already discussed in the books of Ephesians and Philippians. But there's, a, there's it's distinct enough to warrant uh, a separate view. We want to take a, a look here at this particular passage and see some added things that the Lord's given us with regard to Paul's praying for believers. It, uh, it occupies the first part of a section that covers all the way from chapter 1, verse 9, to chapter 2, verse 7. Now, I'm not going to read all, I may refer to the verses in that entire section. <clears throat> I'm not going to take time to read it, but I hope you'll note that this deals with that entire section and I hope that this afternoon sometime you'll you'll take time to read all the way down through the second chapter and the seventh verse at least and see that this is a whole context. Now here we go. Here we go. Verses 9 through 11 which we've read is Paul's prayer for you. Paul's prayer for you. I want you to underline if you don't mind doing that in your Bible or making special note of the expression for you. If you go, if we go down all the way to the 24th verse now, to the 24th verse, like I say, we'll refer to some of these without reading the whole uh, text. He says, who now rejoice in my sufferings with the next two words for you. So in verses nine through 11, we have Paul's prayer for you. In verse 24, we have Paul's sufferings for you. In verses 25 and 26, whereof I'm, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, 
which is given to me, what are the next two words? For you. So we have Paul's prayer for you. Paul's sufferings for you. We have Paul's ministry for you. And then down in chapter 2 and verse number 1, For I would that she knew what great conflict I have for you. So here's Paul's conflict for you. So we have four, four things here. Paul's prayer for you. Paul's sufferings for you. Paul's ministry for you. Paul's conflict for you. Now if we go back up uh, to uh, verses 12 through 20 of chapter 1, we find, well, let's go, I'll go ahead and read it now. Verse number 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad of that? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, where by him were all things created that were in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Well, Brother, Brother Ben got on this um, and he, he took it from many passages. There, there are quite a few passages that talk about God creating everything uh, and then it's for him. They're created by him and they're created for him. Yes. And if we, ever get, if we ever get that much out of the Bible, it'll straighten out a whole lot of things in our lives and in our walk for the Savior because God, everything God created and everything he created for himself. They're created by him and for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things. Talking about the Lord Jesus. He is before all things. By him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things, that, that in all things, he might have the preeminence for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Circle verse 19 here. And be, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven here we have Christ the fullness Christ the fullness and if we go down to verse 24 we have Christ the afflictions look at verse 24 and who now rejoice in my sufferings uh, for you, verse, uh, we're looking at 24. Now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which are behind of the afflictions of Christ. And then not only that, but we have Christ, the riches of the glory. Look at verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his, this mystery, uh, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, Amen. the hope of glory. Amen. So now we've got Christ the fullness, Christ the afflictions, Christ, uh, the, Christ the riches of the glory, and then verse chapter 2, verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of, of wisdom and knowledge. We have Christ the treasury. Amen. So what have we got so far? We've got Paul's prayer for you. We've got Paul's sufferings for you. We've got Paul's ministry for you. We've got, we have the, uh, we have Paul, uh, Paul's conflict for you. What have we got concerning the Lord? You see how packed this is? Amen. Christ the fullness. We have Christ his afflictions. Uh, we have Christ, the riches of the glory. We have Christ, the treasury. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about that affliction. I just want to go back there and touch on in case I don't get back to this. There was some afflictions that the Lord left behind. Look at the verse. Look at the verse where it talks about the Christ, the affliction, verse 24. So there was, we know that Christ was afflicted by God, his Father, for us. 
And God met the need. God met his own standard with regard to the judgment of sin. By his son. He afflicted his son in our place. The substitutionary death and sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the verse tells you that he left some of those afflictions behind. You see the verse? He left, Paul said he left some behind. Who had, to, who had to suffer those afflictions? The apostle Paul. They weren't for us for our salvation, but they were to make our salvation known. There was afflictions in making the work of Christ alone. Christ left some afflictions behind him for the apostle Paul particularly because he was the man that God would use as the revelator of the specific doctrines of this dispensation. The Apostle Paul. We have said we say it once in a while around here. Maybe I ought to say it more often. Paul, the Apostle Paul is, to this dispensation, to the church, uh, what Moses was to the Old Testament nation of Israel, Israel with regard to the law. Yes. Moses was the revelator of God for the dispensation of the law, and Paul is the revelator of God with, with regard to the dispensation of the church. The dispensation of the grace of God. Don't let that word scare you. That word dispensation. That's it's you. Paul uses it four times, and it, and it's very specific. It's not some wild word. And it, but he mentions the dispensation of the grace of God. That expression right there seems to scare a lot of Baptist people. A lot of scare a lot of uh, Baptist preachers. All right, I don't want to get. I don't want to go down that road. I just want you to see what, what we have here in the text. All right, so we, we have that set. And then we have in verses 21 to 23, verses 21 to 23, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, as Christ's flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and reprovable, unrepro unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now we say that we have then the church to be presented blameless. That's in the future. And grounded and settled, that's in the present. Presented blameless, that's the future. Grounded and settled, that's the present. Not only that, but we have in verse 24, we have the church, his body. Verse 24 again, who, hath re who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So we have the church, his body, and then we have the church, uh, every man in the church to be presented perfect. Verses 28 and 29. Verses 28 and 29. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to the working which worketh in me mightily. And then, fourth, we have the church strength rooted and built up and established in chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. You look at those words. You look at those verses yourself. So what have we got? We've got... Paul's prayer for you. We've got Paul's sufferings for you. We've got Paul's ministry for you. We've got uh, we've got Paul's conflict for you. Then we've got Christ the fullness, Christ the afflictions, Christ the riches of the glory, and Christ the treasury. Then we've got the church to be pre uh, presented blameless and grounded and settled. We've got the church, his body. We've got the church, uh, we've got the, uh, the church which, in which every man is to be presented perfect. And then we've got the church rooted, built up, and established. 
So we've got three items introduced four times. In these passages, we've got three items. Do you see them? Introduced four times. Is that complicated for you? Or can you see that? All right? Mark them in your Bible when you get a chance. Three items introduced four times. This covers the context and the teaching of this entire passage all the way down to chapter 2, verse number 7. Four times Paul speaks of something regarding himself with the dispensationally important expression, for you. For you. You know, that, that's important. Paul, the Apostle Paul was the man that God put through this for the church, for us. He's our, he's our apostle. He's our revelator. What he wrote was for us. Amen. Specifically. For us specifically. All right. And then we have four times <coughs> him giving us different aspects of the fullness of the glory of Christ. Four times. And then four times he speaks of the church and its present and future standing. Three items introduced four ways. Now, we mentioned the conflict, and the conflict is down in chapter 2 and verse number 1. It is the conflict for believers. The conflict for the believers was that they might be comforted and have the full assurance which comes from the knowledge of the mystery and from the treasury of God in Christ to the end that they may be established. <clears throat> All right? So there, there you've got the, the conflict. And then you've got his ministry. Again, four, four things. Four things. We've got, we've got three, I should say, three items introduced four ways. Right? And then the ministry, chapter 1, verse number 25. To this, the ministry, his ministry to these believers, it is, it is in view of making known to them Christ as the hope of glory and the riches of the glory of the ministry, uh, mystery among the Gentiles and had as its goal the presenting of every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So you've got the conflict. You've got the mystery. Excuse me, the ministry. And then number three, his sufferings. His sufferings for these believers were joyfully endured by the Apostle Paul inasmuch as to him had been committed. What? What was committed to the Apostle Paul? The truths of the present dispensation. Committed to Paul were the truths first committed to him of the prison dispensation in which you and I live. The church, which is the body of Christ, being Paul's special care. So you've got the conflict, the ministry, the sufferings, and then you've got his prayer. His prayer for the believers, verse number 9. Colossians chapter 1 verse number 9 was to lead them on to recognize the fullness that there is in Christ. Yeah. And we miss it, don't we? Yeah. We miss the fullness that is in Christ. And their perfect and complete acceptance and recognition in Him. So each subject would form a theme in itself of much profit. I mean, we can expand this. You can expand on these things for weeks and weeks and weeks. But in this series, we are particularly interested in the prayers of the Lord's prisoner. We're interested. I wanted you to see in the entire body there from chapter 1 to all the way, uh, verse 1, all the way down to chapter 2, verse 7, a whole picture. Three things being presented uh, four things presented in three different ways. Presented in three different ways. It's all. It's easy to do. Three things presented four different ways. Four things presented. It's, it's four things presented in three different ways. Amen. 
that are just wonderful. And we need to get them. We need to get them. All right. So each in each subject could could flower out, could fan out over a, a big space of study. But we're dealing with the prayers. Chapter one, verse number nine. So we go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and it's composed of three sets of means and ends, or you could say ways and goals. All right, so in verse number 9, the way, in verse number 9, the way, if you're looking at the text, and it's important that you look at the text, verse number 9, the way in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's the way. What is the goal? The goal is that everything be unto all pleasing. Everything in our Christian walk ought to be unto all pleasing. Not pleasing us. Pleasing the Lord. Then the way in verse number 10. The way in verse number 10. In every good work being fruitful. In every good work being fruitful. And then the, way, the, the goal again is the knowledge of God increasing. That the knowledge of God would increase. Not only, not only in us individually, but among those that are around us. Yeah. What kind of life, what kind of Christian life is it? If the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the God of this Bible doesn't increase around you. Yeah. In the thinking of other people. That's, that's your witness. That's your testimony of knowing him. And so there's, there's the way every work being fruitful. The goal is that the knowledge of God is increased all, not only in our own mind. We don't, I'm not interested in being an armchair theologian. Amen. I, think, I think most seminaries are run by armchair theologians. I think they, they sit and think, 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 think until they think things that are, uns, that are not so. And then they, they've got a little coterie of people that they can project it upon. But you won't find, I, I, I've heard this and read this for many years. And I, after, uh, at my age, I think it's, it's mostly true that in seminaries, most of your professors in seminaries are not personal evangelists. They're just armchair theologians. They sit and think a lot, but they're not they're they're not soul winning. They're not they're not evangelizing. They're not out in the battlefield. They just like their armchair. Or the recline or whatever kind of chair they might have. And then the way in verse number eleven, chapter one, verse number number eleven is in all might being strengthened. That's the way. In all might that we have in Christ, being strengthened. What's the goal of it? The goal of it is, look at the verse, unto all patience and long suffering. Unto all patience and long suffering. We're not, we're not, we're not expected to be patient with this world. We're not expected to be long suffering with this world. But we are expected to be patient, long-suffering, waiting for the coming of the Lord. Amen. And people ought to see that patience and long-suffering that we have. Uh, the endurance That endurance is wrought by Christ in us. By the way, in all my being strengthened. Now let me ask you just rhetorically. It's rhetorical. You don't have to answer me. I want you just to think about the question. Is it possible to walk in a manner well-pleasing to the Lord without having a knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding? Is it even possible? I, I'm, I throw that out there as a question for you. Every movement, every movement, I'm talking about religious movement, every movement that is void of the knowledge of his will for the church and his will for this dispensation of the grace of God in which you and I live, every movement that's ignorant of it will mix, listen carefully, they will mix law and grace together. Yes. Number one. 
And they will pervert the gospel into, a, into what is not a gospel. It's another gospel that is not a gospel. Because they will mix law and grace. I'm talking about those who are ignorant of God's will for this period of time. More than a period of time. An administration. A dispensation. You know a dispensation comes from the word dispense. You use that word all the time. Yeah, we, we do. We go to the dispenser. We get a paper towel dispenser. Every, every kind of dispenser that you get something out. Yeah. It administrates what you get and how much of it you get at a time. If it's working right. right. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah. But that's, that's what we're dealing with. We're, we're talking about an order. We're talking about an orderliness that God set up. We're talking about how God dispenses it. And God dispensed a certain body of doctrine and teaching to the church of this dispensation that people that are ignorant of that will mix law and grace together and they will pervert the gospel. They will mix Israel and the church together. Willy-nilly. Yeah. They just mix... Israel and the church all together in the blender. We talk about that a lot. Resulting in their insistence of our practicing the sign gifts to the Jew in the false, twisted, devilish fashion of the charismatic movement. It's twisted. It's messed up. You know why? Because they're ignorant that God has a set of doctrines, a body of things for the church in this dispensation, that it ought not be mixed up with any other dispensation, ought not to be mixed up with Israel. That's part of, but, of Paul's prayer. Having those distinctions is a big part of Paul's prayer. That's why you've got those particular four areas presented, or three areas presented four different ways that we gave you in the in this context. Three areas presented four different ways. Because there's an order to it. And, the, and we need to have the order. And if you want everywhere you go, it's everywhere you go, it's a you, when you deal with people that have got that are mixed up, it's because they will not recognize one that there is a revelator to the church, the apostle Paul. They will not recognize in the New Testament that there is a dispensation of the grace of God specifically. Amen. They, 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 that, so they, they ignore that. They won't talk about that. Baptist preachers won't talk about that. I mentioned earlier this morning that, that Baptist brethren are scared to death of the very expression dispensation of the grace of God. And that's all. Well, it's always been grace. There always has been grace. But Paul says there is a specific dispensation of the grace of God. You can't just get by that. You can't kick that gate open and say it doesn't exist. And without that, without, without taking knowledge of that, you start the big mixing game. The big mixing game. And that's why you've got all kinds of movements that try to take sign gifts to Israel, mix it with the church, and never it, and it never gets rebuked, and it just goes on and on and on. And they say, well, we're just not going to, we'll just leave those people alone. Well, we can leave them. I'm leaving them alone. They're not here. But I have to instruct you. It's my responsibility to instruct you. You know, it, it's not enough, folks. It's not enough to say, well, well, the tongues were for a certain period of time and they're not for now. That's not enough to say that. Why are they not for now? It's important to be able to explain to believers why they're not to get mixed up in that. I'm I have a hard time in, in my spirit right now over a, a family that uh, has all their lives been raised under under Bible-believing preacher. 
and they've all of a sudden just slipped over just because just because you got to have activities for young people, right? For just for the motive of having to have activities for young people, they've moved in their children into a church that mixes all of this stuff together. I won't tell you who, who I'm talking about, but it's 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 a grievance to my spirit to see that. To say to say, well, the most important thing in my life is that there be programs for young people, and who cares about the doctrinal nature as long as there's programs for the young people? Better you not have any programs. Better you create your own programs at home and have programs at home with your own family for your own young people than put them in a church where the doctrine is askew. See, I'm not, I'm not mad at anybody here. I'm telling you the grievance of my heart for a particular family. And, and it's, it's, it's leading to a mixture of their young people with young people that do not believe correctly about the word of God. I can't go any farther than that. Some of you some of you would start to try to work in your mind who I'm talking about. I don't want you to start doing that. Some of you might already know who I'm talking about. And if they don't go through the twisting of the uh, of all of the sign gifts with Israel and all of these things which the charismatics go through. What happens is they ignore the subjects truly related to those gifts, which includes the doctrine, the, the Messiah's kingdom. That's what those things are about, by the way. Yeah. The kingdom of Messiah. And they spiritualize them down to meaning, meaning, meaningless, meaninglessness. Yeah. I had to work on that one a while, all right? I got my tongue tied around my eye teeth and I couldn't see what I was saying. Amen. They just spiritualize it down to mush so as to make them impossible for anybody to study and to properly, properly place in the scripture. Yeah. The desire of every believer surely is that his walk may be worthy of the Lord. And here, in this context, Coloss we're in Colossians, those that came in late, we're in Colossians chapter 1. The apostle indicates, for such a scriptural way to attain that end, we consider first the way. So there's, there's a set of ways and means in the context. The way, read Colossians chapter 1, verse number 9 again. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The knowledge of his will and all spiritual understanding. So Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19. We've looked at this earlier. That the believer might be filled with all the fullness of God. We mentioned that in Sunday school. So we are to be filled with some things. We're to be filled with all the fullness of God. We even gave example of that in Sunday school from Jeremiah chapter 23 that they might not merely have a passing acquaintance with the will of God, which most professing Christians just have a passing acquaintance with things pertaining to the will of God, but that they might really grasp what is important with regard to basically three areas, the will of God for this dispensation, the will of God generally for believers, and then the will of God for themselves. There, there's a will of God for this dispensation. What is God doing 
with this dispensation. You say, I don't really get that. Well, you read the Old Testament, you, you read through the Old Testament to something that is already passed, the dispensation of the law, and you see that God had a will for that period. God had a specific design for that period of time. That period of time is past. The dispensation of the law. You don't, we don't have time to go through all the purposes of the law. We know that it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We know that the law was to make sin exceeding sinful. So we know we know we need a savior. I mean, there you study the why the dispensation of the law, why the purpose, what's the purpose of the law, many many specifics, and then you you say, well, then there must be also a specific will of God for this dispensation. And it has to do with a body. It has to do with the body of Christ. Amen. It has to do with what he is doing in the body of Christ in this dispensation. So what are you going to do if you try to mix the two together? What's going to happen? What if, what if you try to mix what God's will is for this period of time with Daniel's 70th week? You understand what I'm saying? You're gonna, you're, you'll take away the hope. That's right. You'll take away the hope of the church. That's one important manifestation of it. So Paul prayed that believers might be filled with all the fullness of God and not just be passively rather acquainted with something about the will of God, but grasp what God's avenues of his will, how they manifest themselves personally to us, for the, for the dispensation itself, and what is the will of God for all believers? Some things are the will of God for every believer. Every believer ought to be either doing, walking, or performing some things in the will of God. Every believer that you ever meet. But some things are God's will for you that are not God's will for someone else as far as ministry. As far as the direction of your home, family, where you go, where you take your family, how you administrate certain things with regard to your own children because of God's call on their lives. So there are things that are individually God's will for you that cannot be, cannot be judged from here. That even your pastor can't even tell you what the will of God for you individually is in some area. He might fear for you. He might wonder if you are finding out, but, he, he, you know, based on your attitude towards certain things, but really he cannot know. I don't know who God's going to call. It is not the preacher's responsibility to call anyone to preach or to set someone in a particular ministry. So this thing about the will of will of God is, is vital. It's important. It's not just, it's, it's easy to get up in the morning. It's easy for anyone to get up in the morning and say, well, this happened yesterday in my life, and that happened the day before, and it happened the day before. So I reckon it'll just be that way again today, and I'll just, I'll just rest and be comfortable in things just taking place. That, you know, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, right? Rather than, that's, that's easier for most professing Christians than getting up in the morning and saying, God, I, I need to know your will today. Amen. I need to know where you want me today. I need to know how to, how to obey you today. I need to know who I ought to go witness to today. I need this today. It'd be fresh every day. Yeah. That takes a little effort. Yeah. Amen. That takes a little conscientiousness spiritually on the part of God's children. God worketh all things, Paul said in Ephesians 1.11, after the counsel of what? The counsel of his own will. Yes. God worketh everything according to the counsel of his own will. So what if you're not interested in God's will today? What if, what if there are God's people, some of God's own children who's never even fathomed or meditated at all 
on what the will of God is. If he works out everything according to the counsel of his own will, aren't you going to miss something? Aren't you going to be outside in the cold on some things? See, it takes an effort on the part of, this is, this is all involved in that prayer in verses 9 through 11 of Colossians chapter number 1. Knowing the will of God. And you can know the will of God. I say, I've said this through the years because, <clears throat> you know, I was, a, <clears throat> I was a teenager, young adult in the Air Force during the days of, uh, of the price is right, you know. <clears throat> that stupid, crazy, ridiculous, I'm glad that, I'm glad that I'm not, I don't need, that's, my goodness, that material, all that materialistic stuff that it fostered. Those kind of game shows on television. But you know, they did this thing, is the, is, the, is the prize behind door number one, door number two, or door number three? I want to tell you something. God is not hiding his will from you. God is not telling you, you have to figure out if it's behind door number one, door number two, or door number three. God is not some kind of divine game show host trying to trick you. God wants you to know his will. We'll put it out in front. But I want to say this. There, there are still multitudes of God's people, God's own children who never get it. Because they are so satisfied, que sera, day to day. They're not interested in the will of God. They're not interested in the joys of being in the will of God. They're not interested in the excitement and, and even the adventure of being in the will of God from time to time. They're not interested in that. You know, most, most of the people who get interested in that, in the will of God, become what? Usually become missionaries. <laughs> where they, where they, boy, they, they, got, they get to where they got to pray for it, man. They, gotta, they, they want to know it on a daily basis. The, the, they, this plan didn't work, all right? I don't want plan B. I just want God's will. Amen. I don't want to go through plan A, plan B. That's, that's going back to the door. Is God's will behind door number one, door number two, door number three? When God can manifest it to you and wants to manifest it to you and has with regard to his, his will for this dispensation, he has given it to you. He has given it to you. If you will div rightly divide the word of truth and not mix everything together just like it was some kind of Russian goulash or borscht. You know what borscht is. That's a soup. It's a Russian soup. All right? So if you don't, if you don't read your Bible like that, God can show you what his will is for this dispensation. And it involves a when you find out, by the way, God's will for this dispensation, it, and it doesn't excite you and want to get you in and operating within that will, there's something wrong. There's something awful wrong. Amen. Amen. There's something, there's something awful wrong. Four times in the first 11 verses of Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle emphasizes this sovereign will in the first 11 verses four times of Ephesians chapter 1 the circumspect walk of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 is linked together with understanding what the will of the Lord is huh? Look, look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Let's stay there a minute. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Seeing then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, wherefore be not unwise, Amen. but what? Understanding what the will of the Lord is. That, you know, 
uh, if the Lord tells you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, can you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. Absolutely. If the Lord says, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, can you understand what the will of the Lord is if the Lord tells you to do that? Amen. Absolutely, you can understand what the will is. The Lord's not hiding it from you. You may be shoving stuff in front of it to keep it hidden from yourself, but the Lord isn't. The Lord wants you to know the will. And then you read on. Verse 18, and be not, we covered this in Sunday school, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with what? Spirit. Earlier in the book, he said, be filled with all the fullness of God. Here he says, be filled with the Spirit. If he tells you to be filled with the Spirit, can you be filled with the Spirit? Yeah. You can be filled with the Spirit. Every believer, can, every one of his children can be filled with the Spirit. And what would happen? What would happen if just this number showed up next Sunday morning filled with the Holy Ghost. Huh? I don't know that we'd know what to do with ourselves. We would because we'd be filled with the Spirit. Have you ever known to be have you ever known yourself to be filled with the Spirit? You can be filled with the Spirit. You can be filled with the knowledge of his will. You can be filled with all the fullness of God. You can be filled with the spirit. We are told to be filled with some things. But whatever we have to do to be filled, we need to, whatever we have to get rid of, whatever stopper we've got on top of the jar preventing him from filling us, we need to get rid of it and let him fill us. Whatever, whatever it is in our walk, our attitude, our, 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 our view of, of the things of God, our view towards people whom he came to save, whatever it is that's in the way of him pouring out and filling us with his spirit, we need to get, we need to get it out of the way and be filled with the spirit. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. It's, it's interesting that servants in Ephesians chapter 6, I mean, I've been in a, all these things right in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 6, if you look at that, servants there. In, in Ephesians 6, dealing with the six relationships there that, uh, with regard to the home, actually. And, he's, and their servants in their manifestation of unity of the Spirit were to render their daily and menial services. How? In the unity of the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 6, it says, Not with thy service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing what? Doing the will of God from the heart. A servant is told, a servant under an earthly master, of course, when you get to, when you deal with the master in Ephesians chapter 6, he's to forbear threatening. He's, a, he's also a believer. All of these, all of the relationships in, in Ephesians chapter 6, it is assumed that we're talking, the scripture assumes we're talking about saved individuals. So it's saved servants and saved masters. So he tells that he tells a saved master how to treat a saved servant, and he tells a saved servant how to obey a saved master. And he tells that servant, doing he says it, doing the will of God from the heart. And so someone might think, how is it that a servant to a man can do the will of God from the heart? But he can. If God said he can, he can. Yes. He can do the will of God from the heart. Yes. And in all of these relationships in the home, if we do what is the will of God in our relationship in our home, regardless of what anybody else does in our home, God will use that. God will use that to manifest his power and his, his strength and his fidelity to us. So if a, if a saved man doesn't have a saved wife, or if a saved man has a wife that's not acting saved, if a saved man has a wife that is not filled, a filled husband doesn't have a filled wife, or a filled wife doesn't have a 
filled husband, if she will do or he will do the will of God in his place as a father and a husband, Ephesians chapter number six, then God will honor that to the extent that he fills his place. This is, this is a question that comes up in on the mission field because you have, well, I don't know that there's much difference now. You've got now so much distress in homes now in America, but uh, let's, let's take China, for example, where you have so many more saved women in church than you have saved men. And so that means, and, and most of them are married, so you've got all these saved women in church and most of their husbands are not there. Most of their husbands are not interested in the things of God. They're not saved. They're sitting home or they're out doing business or something. And so the wives have this question. How do I do what God told me to do as a wife? How, how do I submit as a wife when I know that my husband takes no thought of it, no, he doesn't care at all because he doesn't know the Lord. That's an important question, isn't it? But I believe that if a wife will do her role as a child of God, God will use that. And Peter tells you, did you? First Timothy, First Peter, chapter right. number three, and many passages, God will use that testimony in the home. And the wife may not know to what extent at any given moment, but if she will just do God's will for her as a wife. If a, if a saved husband has an unsaved wife, if he will do his role as a, as a husband and then fathers also in Ephesians chapter number six. So with regard to his wife and with regard to his children, the impact is greater than we can imagine because he is doing the will of God. And God will not just let that go by without the fruitfulness of it. And then what about children that have unsaved parents? See, these are, these are important questions. How do, how do you instruct young people to obey their parents? They're to obey their parents in the Lord. Whether or not their parents are saved or not. Will God, will God take up for them when they do that from the heart? Will not God come in and undergird them in that? I believe he will. I believe he will. I believe the impact will be wonderful upon that home. So we can be filled. What God tells us to do we can do. Then, and then I'll give you this, and we'll stop for the, we'll stop for today. Remembering the logical service of Romans chapter twelve, verses number one and two. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. That's H O L Y. You know, uh, I, I, I dare say that most of the time when we're dealing with this passage, we never stop at and discuss H-O-L-Y. Holiness is not a... I'm, stu I'm studying Numbers chapter 9 right now. I'm, I'm working on Numbers chapter 9, and I'm talking about in my own personal study. And... I'm dealing with the I'm dealing with the fact that there are there there were instructions given under Moses for those who would take the Passover and it was on the we've we've just discussed it before on the first on the fourteenth day of the first month but what if a man was defiled by coming across a dead body? Or what if he was at a distance and couldn't get to the observance of the Passover? You've got defilement and distance brought up. 
And Moses didn't know the answer. Moses was meek enough to say, I don't know. And he went to God, went to the Lord and to find out. And the Lord said, the Lord said, all right, for them, it will be the 14th day of the second month. They weren't ready on the four, on the 14th day of the first month. So there's an opportunity on the 14th day of the second month. When he gives the instructions for the 14th day of the second month for the defiled and the distant, he, he goes back, the Lord goes back, and he gives the stringentness of the observance. I'm talking about gives the, gives the specifications for the Passover in a more stringent, stringent and disciplined fashion for the second month than he does for the first month. I'm talking about in the book of Numbers. Why does he do that? I'll tell you why he does that. Because the very fact that he says those who were defiled and distant still will observe the Passover, but not on the not in the first month. Not in the first month, but in the second month. So they've got that time to, they've got that time with the Lord for a month. That's grace. That's grace toward the defiled. That's grace toward the distant. But God said, I will not lower my standard. Amen. I will not lower my standard. I can show grace to the defiled. I can show grace to the distant. But do not ever think that the God of heaven lowers his standard with regard to the things that are holy. He wouldn't want to. Amen. See? I'm spending some time with the Lord in that area of study. So we don't stop and deal with H. O L Y. As frequently and all, as often as we do, we like to talk about grace and we like to talk about love. We talk about, I like to talk about the long suffering, the loving kindness of God, and I love to do it too. But we ought to be just as enthusiastic about talking about the holiness of God as anything, because we need that grace and that long suffering because God is holy. And never, never should we suppose or presume upon God thinking he's going to lower his standard. So those that were not necessarily deviled coming in on a dead person or not necessarily distant, they too can get a little sloppy in things. They say, well, I'm just not going to, I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting tired of this. I think I'll just lay out of this one. I think I'll just stay home this time. Okay. God, does, God doesn't lower his standard. God's not going to lower his requirement. So he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. Now he's talking to Christians. He's already talking to people who have experienced the grace of God. He's talking to believers that have been saved by grace through faith. When he says that she present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable to be holy. Amen. It's not unreasonable to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It's in fact, it's by his mercies. So it's entirely reasonable that we do it. It's our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. Don't transform yourself. Be transformed by the power of God. His mercies, the workings of God's spirit in you. 
Don't think you're going to figure it out and do the work yourself. Yeah. I one one man one man said said uh, uh, I, I'm a self-made man. Another man said, "Yeah, you're you're a good example of unskilled labor." Then. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it's not. It, it is. It is be made. Yes, amen. It is be made. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect, you say, will of God. It's ours to prove what the will of God is. I'm going to stop there for this morning. We've got more. I'm going to go next Sunday morning. I'm going to illustrate some of this from Proverbs chapter number 16. We don't have time this morning to, today. We'll have to carry that out. You don't want a God that lowers his standards. You want, you want a God who is holy and you want to present your body by his mercies. Holy. A living sacrifice, reasonable. Yeah, so we have to know something about the will of God. So when we pray for one another then, because he was praying, this is prayer. Colossians chapter 1. This continues the prayers of the Lord's prisoner. So when we pray for one another, what we ought, what ought we to be praying now? That they would know, have an understanding of what? The will of God. The perfect will of God. How often do we stop and, and actually name people on our prayer list and say, Lord, give that individual an understanding of the will, your will. It, go, it goes beyond our health, doesn't it? It goes beyond our finances. It goes beyond the temporal. The prayer life goes... The, a, a, a prayer life, as Paul presents prayer in the epistles, is far beyond the temporal things that we need. Never neglect those things. I, I have to stop and say that every time. Because I don't want you to stop praying for people's needs as they express them. Yeah. I'm just saying that our prayers ought to go beyond that for one another. They ought to be high, go higher than that for one another. All right, let's stand. David, bring us, bring us a song, if you will. Be filled with the knowledge of his will be filled with all the fullness of God be filled with the spirit all three of those in the book of Ephesians we need those things today we need those things how about you this morning all right David. 296 in your songs and hymns from the heart 296 is your all on the altar Stand again, 296. On that first, you have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have. that involve his will for every believer. It's, it's, it's his will that all of us study our Bible. It's his will that all of us pray. 
It's His will that all of us evangelize. It's His will that all of us, and there's very specific instructions for our homes, families. That's the will. Those things are the will for every believer. That's right. No exception. But then there's God's will for you as an individual. He has some things for you to do that He won't have me do. Right. All right. So those three areas. Those three areas. That we're seeing that next verse. You want the will of God? Is it is his will acceptable for you? All the second. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always? You must do his sweet will to be free. about any issue. We're not priests. You don't have to confess anything to us. You do your confession of your sins to the Lord himself. All right? But if there's some other way we can counsel with you concerning his will, help you, help you in some way in the word of God, we're happy to do that. We're ministers. We're not priests. All right? I think there's an important distinction. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. It has to do with his faithfulness and justice. Both are involved. Amen. Amen. He is faithful and just. The justice for the required for the forgiveness of your sins were all was all dealt with at the cross. God poured out justice on the cross your sins on his son. And that's the basis of redemption and your individual salvation. So if there's someone here not saved, that's that's where you go. That's where you go for it. You go to the substitutionary work of Christ where your sin was placed on Christ and say, I'll go to heaven on that. Amen. Amen. I'll go to heaven on that. I'll go to heaven that my sins were paid for. God saw the, of the travail of his soul and was satisfied. Amen. God is satisfied with what happened in heaven for the sins of every sinner. Every sinner. You can go to heaven on that. You'll trust him. Start there. And then as a believer, you know, you get up in the morning, you know before the feet, your feet have hit the floor, you need to tell the Lord about something. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. That's the way we are. So just, just continue telling the Lord, confessing to the Lord. All right. I'm going to stop right there. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day you've given to us. Thank you for the marvelous grace already bestowed, your, your kindness to us even today. Father, to allow us to be here, to allow us to have the breath. Lord, we, we don't even deserve to breathe your good air. And yet you've given us life and breath. You said in Acts chapter 17, you've given all those things to us, Father, but they're to be used to be. So, Father, help us. Help us, Lord. Help us with the, with every area, the area, of, not only the area of grace, the mercies of God, but the area of holiness and thy holy standards, Father, for us. And Father, make us glad in those things. Lord, we've known that you do that. We've known for all these years that in the will of God we find sweetness. It's, it's you there, Father. 
It's you being there. We don't want to miss it. We don't want to be put. We don't want to be outside, Father. We don't want to be off track. We want to be right in the in where not only where it's good and perfect, Father, but not only have you accepted it, but we want it to be acceptable in our own heart. We want our hearts to accept your word. Amen. Daily. Thank you, Lord. Bless the folks that are here. Father, we're about to have a meal. The ladies have taken time and pains, Father, to put the meal together. We ask that you bless their hands. And uh, any other contribution, Father, to the meal, we thank you for that one and for that contribution, Father. We're grateful. If you, if you didn't provide it, we wouldn't have it. We wouldn't be able to enjoy it. We thank you for it. And ask that you bless the hands of your servants that prepared it. Father, we ask that you touch the rest of the day. Give us direction for the remainder of the day. We'll thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, you're dismissed. Thank you.